Coach McCormick, thank you so much for your time. Really looking forward to uh, reconnecting with you. It's been a while since we last met. Um, so for the listeners at home, will you kind of just tell us a little bit about your background, your motivation, and kind of where you are currently? For sure, man. I really appreciate it. I, I really uh, have enjoyed a lot of the podcasts you put up. and I commented earlier to you that the content you've put up and a lot of the questions that you've been asking have have been really good. So I think for our field, a lot of us appreciate it because it's it's being flooded by a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the direction, especially that you've won, I think has been really good. So Awesome. Thank um, you. My name is Chris McCormick. I'm the head strength and conditioning coach for Olympic sports at Florida Atlantic University. Um, I've been here about six or seven months, um, and I transitioned from Gardner-Webb University in North Carolina, which is not too far away from you. I was there for about three years as the director over all sports, including football. Um, Previous to that, I was an assistant at EKU in Kentucky um, for Mm -hmm. a couple years, Mm -hmm. and I was a head strength and conditioning coach at the University of West Alabama um, in 2013. Um, I was there for about six months, and then I was an intern, and I started my career in strength and conditioning. at Charleston Southern University with um, strength and conditioning and um, was an assistant there, uh-huh. was helpful in all the sports, um, transitioning from football coaching. Um, so I think really motivation-wise, it's um, it's really defined by my why, and I think my purpose, and I feel, is to, to serve and sacrifice for others mm. to help lead them to success. Okay. And I think all of those things are, are driven off of that. Yeah. Um, one day I hope to go into administration, okay. and I think that why still serves that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's one I love about athletics. Uh, I've been multiple places. I've seen different things, and the football side, Olympic side, and um, just those relationships with, with staff and athletes mm-hmm. and, and developing those things and pushing those things along, um, I think it is great. And um, that feedback and, and just the motivation every day of that we get to impact others, mm-hmm. um, and not just in the weight room, but yeah. uh, across the department completely. Yeah. No, and I think that why is, is hugely important and that a lot of people like start out with that why but then kind of forget that once they get into, you know, the rat race. So uh, yeah. I, I like uh, pointing it back to that, you know. Yep. And then will you just expand a little bit on your time at, at Charleston Southern and kind of transitioning from uh, from football coaching to strength coaching? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I have a really unique story. Everyone opens the podcast up of what they've done and where they've been. And mm-hmm. um, my... Uh, I originally started in coaching when I was in undergrad, okay. um, and I, I wanted to be a football coach. It was either going to be in the high school realm. I, I was a student in, a student assistant at Indiana State, yeah, um, with the football team, and you know I was around strength and conditioning, and and I was around coaching, and I really decided that once to grad school, and mm-hmm. I was looking into grad school that I most likely wanted to have a job where I could actually settle down and mm. not be moving all the time <laughs> like, like I currently am. <laughs> yeah, and um, um, so. I got married right before I went to grad school and I went to grad school for school psychology, which okay. is like a sub facet of, uh, neuropsychology or what you would see of working with children, like mm-hmm. a pediatric side. Okay. Um, so I went there, I received my master's at ball state. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going for my PhD and, um, was going to become a professor, have my own practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just felt through my faith that I was going to be called back into coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, and me and my wife kind of made the the decision move and um i I messaged some coaches and and emailed some people around and um i got a call from charleston southern to become an intern for football Mm -hmm. and i went down there and i wasn't getting paid or anything like that Mm -hmm. and they hired a new strength and conditioning coach and uh, we started hanging out and and i lifted and i did power lifting and things like that Mm -hmm. and so we, we developed a really good relationship and um you know, he just kept talking to me. He's like, you know, I think you'd be really good at this. I think this is something you should look into. And like I said, I was around it. Mm-hmm. But once I got towards the end of spring ball, April, May, um, he didn't have an assistant. It was just him for mm-hmm. about 13 or 14 teams. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think he was looking for help and he kind of, he kind of weaseled me into <laughs> it. And, uh, you know I mean? He yeah. came in and I kind of watched and, you know, finally he was like, what do you think? And I was like, you know what? I, I think this might be why I'm here. Yeah. And so, uh, day one, he threw me into the fire and a drill was like, you got this agility drill, go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I knew as soon as I went home, I told him, I was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. So ever since then, it's kind of, uh, I went there for one thing and it totally turned into something else and, yeah. and kind of those steps kind of along the way, I think yeah. is, it, it's been a really interesting ride. And yeah. I try to tell people that, um, just for the fact of, my background is a little bit different, but I think I have a different perspective on strength and conditioning mm-hmm. too, because I don't have the traditional 
route that yeah. a lot of coaches have taken. Yeah. Um, but we've taken a lot of steps of faith too along the way. Mm-hmm. So for us, it's 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 been nerve wracking sometimes, but it's been <laughs> exciting. Yeah. No, that's that's super interesting. And yeah. so, what are, what are some of the things that you've you've kind of touched on a little bit, right? But some of the other things that you've learned at like Charleston Southern, like West Alabama, Eastern Kentucky, Gardner Webb, like all the other places you've been at. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think at Charleston Southern, I think the biggest thing for me is, was learning probably about my faith personally mm. and taking that leap of faith down there. But yeah, um, realizing, kind of making those steps and getting to do something that you're really, really passionate about. I, I was talking to my wife the other day of, there's a lot of people we know that they, it's not that they hate their job, but mm-hmm. they go to their job and it's kind of like a mindless activity. And, yeah. and for us, especially and people that are in the field, if you're going to work this many hours mm-hmm. that you better enjoy it. Yeah. And I think, um, I, I realized that really quick of something that I wasn't even getting paid for yeah. how much I I just, I love doing it. And yeah. again, it goes back to the relationships and the people mm-hmm. and that's, you know, the biggest reason of it, but just getting to do something day in and day out, um, that makes an impact, yeah. but it's something that you wake up and you're excited to go to work. And mm-hmm. I think that was probably the biggest thing at Charleston Southern West Alabama. Um, I learned how to handle a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I, I interviewed there as a graduate assistant mm-hmm. thinking that it was just going to be a complimentary position. Mm-hmm. And when I got to the interview, they told me you're going to be the head strength coach. <laughs> you can take grad school yeah. and you can, you can do those things. You're going to get paid not a lot of money and you have all the teams except football. <laughs> um, so I had to figure out really quick yeah. how to handle a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a blessing because I got thrown into the fire again. I think that's how I, I learned the best. Yeah. Um, but we had three weight rooms on campus. Okay. Um, baseball had their own. We had a little one that basketball used. We mm-hmm. had one that football used and they pretty much had first say on everything. Mm-hmm. So I was putting med balls in the trunk, driving across <laughs> campus, trying to balance all of those things. Yeah. Um, so I think that was the biggest trial by fire because that was my first head strength and conditioning coach position, yeah. but I didn't know what I was doing. So mm. it was kind of like, <laughs> you've got to figure it out. Um, and that those day-to-day activities of not even having a staff, but doing all of that stuff to see what needs to be done. So yeah. as you go farther and farther, when you do have a staff, then figuring out what do I need to delegate? What do I need to do? Mm. You know, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Um, EKU, it was a great experience. I mean, a lot of our teams were really good. Okay. Um, I think when that we were nice. in our conference in the OVC, yeah, yeah we men's basketball team made the, the NCAA tournament, almost beat Kansas, wow. um, was one of the teams I had. Um, our football team made the playoffs mm. in the FCS level. Um, our tennis team, softball, like a lot of our teams were really, really good. And I think the one thing I learned was don't take – winning for granted yeah um because it seems pretty easy sometimes yeah. and i think that's where when you win a lot and especially in strength and conditioning people tying success to like them saying uh-huh. well i was a major reason why it's not to say i did that but my transition to gardner webb where traditionally they were not very good yeah, yeah. Um, you see how quickly all of the pieces that you need to be successful it's mm-hmm. coaching talent you know setting budget like all yeah. those things that go into it yeah, yeah, yeah. support um I think that's something that opened my eyes because it was almost a 180 and a complete opposite. So when I got to Gardner Webb, it was like, okay, yeah, how do we do these things, and how much can I do in the the small piece I have within our athletic department to, yeah. to influence a lot of things? And I, I grew a lot at Gardner Webb. I mean, it was I had multiple staff members. I got to meet a lot of great people there, mm-hmm. um, and, and there was a lot of times where I really learned about my response in a situation and of the things that I can control Mm -hmm. and not focusing on what other things I cannot control. Yeah. Um, and I think it was, it was good for me as I came to Florida Atlantic because I I got to take a lot of those experiences and then come in where the mistakes coming in too hard on certain issues and not coming in hard enough and setting the tone as the director. Mm -hmm. Um, as I know you've had some changes um, around strength and conditioning. Yeah. Um, just learning to choose your spots, I think, would be the biggest thing. Mm, so. Yeah, no, that, that's really good. And then you touched a little bit on balance, right? So how do you kind of balance family life and work? So you being married um, for quite some time now, how has that kind of affected the job and vice versa? Yeah, I mean, it's I'm very fortunate and blessed. My, my wife stays home, mm-hmm. and that's with our children. We have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. Okay. And, um, you know, our daughter's in kindergarten now, so it is mm. a little different. But, I mean, our children have been in coaching since we've been in it, and I've mm. been married since. Uh, like I said originally, my wife thought I was going to be a psychologist, so she signed up for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> coach, so. Psych. Um, 
the the balance aspect i think i've heard people say that you can't balance things that are not equal Mm -hmm. um coaching takes a lot of time yeah and that's something that's a constraint Mm -hmm. and i think it's figuring out of the time that you have even my wife will tell me and if she were to come on that she would say it's about quality it's not about the quantity of things and People say these cliche terms, Mm -hmm. but it it is truly about that because you are in a position where there's a lot of things time wise I get to do with my kids that I don't get to or with my wife Mm -hmm. or my family. But then there's a lot of times where like over Christmas break, I was here while my family went home. Mm -hmm. So there's certain aspects that, that isn't as fun, but I think the balance is just like in the weight room or anything else is figuring out what the group that you're with Mm -hmm. what they need because it might be quality it might be quantity Mm -hmm. um you might not be able to do certain things and that's one thing my wife and i have um really tried to do um and we're expanding upon is my wife has a coach's wives podcast Mm -hmm. she has a network of coaches wives that they all deal with the same problems and the same issues and Mm -hmm. having that community just as much as we do as coaches but um really trying to impact others that are coming up that might be single, might be younger and be like, I want you to know what you're walking into with this family life, because depending on what you are shooting for as a coach, Mm -hmm. logo wise, salary wise, like all these things, like it's going to dictate the balance of your work and your family. Because honestly, some jobs are going to be a lot more demanding than others. Um, And you've got to figure out, I think more number one, what, what's important to you. Mm -hmm. And then number two, then what's going to be, you know, obviously, and it could be the number one thing if you want to say that is what's most important to your family. But you mm-hmm. got to know as the coach, if you're yeah. the one in it, what do you want and what's going to make you happy? Because mm-hmm. the logo and the place isn't going to make you happy. It's going yeah. to be the people and the things around you to support you so you can have that joy and it can kind of shine through. Mm, I like that. Okay. So have you always wanted to be an Olympic sports strength coach or, or what kind of has driven that decision versus being a football strength coach? Yeah, I mean, I I started in football, like I said, Mm -hmm. so if you were to tell me I would be in the Olympic side, I think I would have been like, well, I I don't know as much if that would be the case. Um, I've really enjoyed influencing a lot of sports, so Mm -hmm. I think the the FCS level, the Division II level, um, you have a hand, especially being the director of being over 17, 18, 19 teams, and I know a lot of people would be like, and maybe even salary-wise, like, I just want to focus on one team. Yeah. And I think for me, I think it's been awesome because, you know, even here I have three female teams and one male team Uh and I've never, I've never had that breakdown. And I came from a place where I took over teams eventually, but I had football and men's basketball. So it's Mm. complete culture difference. Yeah. Um, But also I've worked with all these different teams in the past, but Mm. I think just my philosophy and my principles, um, really aligned to the Olympic side. And I've talked to a lot of people like Nate Bergerson at yeah. NC State. And okay. A lot of people around of like, if, if if I make this transition and you were in football, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes people are like, if you go one way, you may not be able to go back. Yeah. I think it's not about the sport per se. I think it's about the attitudes and mm-hmm. the people and um, being able to focus more with even some of the training methods and means that I use. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of those things may gravitate towards more of the Olympic side where yeah. football is a specific culture, depending on your head coach and as much as any other team. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think for me too, one of my next steps is hopefully to go into administration. Okay. So diversifying my career, yeah. and maybe focusing and going somewhere else. Um, and I think I, I've been very fortunate. Plus, I mean, our, our, our school is on the beach. We're literally two miles from the beach, so it's been a blessing <laughs> yeah, in that yeah. sense of, of being able to have that. Um, but like I said before, it's like what you want. Yeah. And I think just as I've grown through my career, I'm like, you know, I think this would be really cool if I could focus on X, Y, and Z. Mm. Um, and it may not be a specific sport. Yeah. So if that is a single sport and I get to do that one day, or if not, I think it's try to see all those factors, especially going into a new position yeah. of like, yeah, like I want these things and it might be more important than just training this X team mm. or in this setting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. Okay. And you kind of touched a little bit on your, on your education, right? So how important is continuing education to you? Oh, I, I think it's, um, uh, even when I came here with our budget, um, cause our budgets kind of spread with a lot of different things and nutrition, things like that is, um, really, maximizing everything we have so the number one thing we could use is, is for CEUs mm. um, I, I want our staff I want 
and I think everybody is obviously should continue to grow and learn. But yeah. I think a lot of people talk about it from the conference standpoint of um, going to something like that, and especially the networking opportunities. But mm-hmm. going and visiting other people, having people come audit you. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many ways I think to get CEUs and yeah. and different ways of online stuff now that I think that's what needs to be done. But I think you need to be exposed to a lot of this yeah. just so. A, you figure out what your principles are, but B, but you can start weeding out the things that don't align with you or yeah. that might be just stuff that is is not really good. Yeah, yeah, Having yeah. that filter on, because if you stay in your ways, that's fine and certain things work, obviously, but I think you're going to get to a point, especially with, I found even with sports coaches now, uh-huh. they're reading and seeing so much stuff yeah. that if you're not staying up to date, it's not just the weight room. Mm like the checklist type of thing for coaches now. It's like I saw, especially in baseball, like all these sports that are especially skill-driven. Yeah. I mean, they're seeing these things, and if you can't answer or say or different, like coaches are going to question that a lot of times. Yeah. So I think having those answers, because a lot of coaches, especially on the Olympic side, are very open, I've found, to a lot of things. Yeah, And if you can get the one up on that, I think that's going to help buy in. But Mm -hmm. I think it's going to help your case of – um, moving along in your career. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think, like I said, there's a lot of ways to do it. Yeah. Um, people say they don't have money, they don't have the resources, things like that. There's a lot of ways to do it. Yes. Yeah. You have to be open and honest of what you can do yeah. and, and pursuing the things that are going to work for you in your setting. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think that's an important point that you mentioned about sport coaches, right? Is, is there so much resources out there? Um, but there's a lot of half resources, right? So coaches are reading things and it's, it's not fully like a fully baked idea. And now they're coming to you with this half baked thing. And if you don't know, like you said, that's, you're going to get eaten alive. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's really, really important. And then kind of moving forward, right? So how important is it to have hobbies? Um, I know there's not a lot of time in the day, right? But yeah. to have hobbies or some kind of a life outside of strength and conditioning. I mean, I think it's it's super important, uh-huh. and you know, I'm probably the first one to say I don't have a lot of hobbies outside. Mm-hmm. I want to say that my hobby is uh, continuing and enjoying what my job entails, but then mm-hmm. my family is my biggest hobby just because yeah. of the time I have. And my my position here, honestly, is time wise, yeah. is a little bit different than any one other I've had, and mm-hmm. I think a lot of that is to do with not having football because mm-hmm. of the hours of the early early mornings and late late nights and, yeah. and however those things go but um i think more importantly it's having a support system outside of here because yeah. that is the one thing of um the job is eventually going to go away it's yeah you either been fired or you're about to get fired and, uh-huh. <laughs> it, it, and i've been very fortunate not to have been have happened to me yet yeah. but you're going to come home to somebody that is always going to be there and i think if you don't focus on those things yeah. um, it may not be there and mm. i think that that system of support but also being able to get your mind away because that's one of my probably biggest faults is i go 110 miles an hour and my yeah. mind is always running yeah and, and finding those other things that it may be training it might be um picking up like a hobby like playing the guitar mm-hmm. or anything like that but having especially something else that you can focus your energy on because it might fill you back up so mm-hmm. you become a better coach when you go back into the setting mm, i like that okay and so moving forward a little bit, right, so what are some general nutrition recommendations you might have in terms of, uh, like, supplement recommendations or things like that? Yes, I think for the athlete or just mm-hmm. in general, I think that's one of the biggest struggles we have. Of mm-hmm. That's the one thing we don't control a lot mm-hmm. of the times, especially some of the smaller budget schools. Yeah. Um, I think education is the number one thing we can do. Yeah. And I think simplifying it and, and – one big thing I've really tried to do lately is using a lot of graphics and a lot mm. of uh, different ways to communicate that information. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, having basic recommendations of, you know, if it's macros, if it's, you know, if you have specific issues that athletes have, mm-hmm. um, depending on what you're giving, if you are giving them nutrition or not, mm-hmm. um, I think emphasizing that stuff and putting it in the athlete's face mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. Um, because again, if you can't control, it's just like sleep and recovery. Mm even lifestyle stuff it's if i can't walk them along and put something on their plate or tell them and know what time they're going to bed then Mm -hmm. how do you truly influence that yeah um in the long run like i said for schools that may not have a bunch of training tables and Mm -hmm. and different things like that so i think it's having the basic recommendations Mm -hmm. um depending on the resources that you have but actually getting across information that, that you know that they can do 
Um, and it puts so much information and accessibility in their hands. So mm-hmm. when they go to make the decision, um, they have the right information and the simple information to make those best informed choices. Yeah. Um, so you're not just spinning your wheels for no reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's, you know, I've never been in a big time school where we mm-hmm. have where I know they can get all these things and all these supplements. Yeah. To the point of we've had to be creative about how we're going to get this across. We know when mm-hmm. you are gone for the 18 to 20 hours a day, mm-hmm. you're making those those good choices. Yeah. OK. And so let's talk a little bit more about um, special cases. Right. So if you have a kid that's that's really struggling with weight loss, right, they're doing all the right things or vice versa, really struggling with weight gain, doing all the right things. Yeah. Um, what are some general recommendations that you might have for them? Well, I think it's you know, all of our athletes. We really start off with like a three day log and it's like, I want you to tell me every single thing you're eating. Cause mm-hmm. usually, I mean, I work with the basketball population, yeah. you know, and in any athlete population in general, other yeah. than probably you see with football a lot of times is I tell them a lot, you know, you're, let me see how much you're eating. Yeah. I want you to write down the sizes. And if you use my fitness pal, a lot of yeah. times we'll go that route so they can record those things. Mm-hmm. But nine times out of 10, um, most of these athletes don't even eat close to what my six year old daughter <laughs> eats. A day. Yeah. So it's like, I'm like, it, it, you want to get to a point of X goal. If it's loss or gain, uh-huh. like you need to be aware of what you are putting in your body or what you're not putting in your body. Yeah. And then, we need to know some of the background. Um, We've had athletes that have totally stopped eating meat Mm. and it's like, okay, well, how do I attack this situation where you you probably need this and protein Mm -hmm. and different things like that? How do we get that across to you where we're not even being offensive to maybe a lifestyle change or it could be a religious thing. It could Uh be something like that where how you come in because then you could also lose the attention of the athlete right Mm. off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. No, by the words that you say yeah that's a big and point i think it's i think self-awareness is the biggest thing but also getting them to understand you know self-control and also figuring out that discipline side of making these decisions daily mm-hmm. and how much you know, how important the sport is to you of you getting to these goals this yeah. is what you need to do and i want you to understand that this is as much part of a skill mm-hmm to kind of for you to learn as yeah. much as a skill on the court or on the field and i think it it, it it's getting across that skill side. And that's something I've really tried to do is you have these skills, you either you have it or you don't. So mm-hmm. how are you going to build it? And it's going to be hard, Yeah. but how are we going to build this daily into your routine so we can get you to that goal? Yeah. Um, but again, there's a lot of methods doing it. It just becomes it's so much that communication aspect and the relationship you have with them. Because yeah. I think if you don't have a relationship with them, then it's going to be very hard I work with three female teams, mm-hmm. so yeah. me talking about nutrition can get a little bit different of coming from male. Yeah. How do I get across and use the coaches and the athletic training staff and uh-huh. people around me to get that message across too yeah. that I may not, not be able to get across just as much as an athlete and the staff members being able to get a message across. Yeah, no, I like that. And then, I mean, obviously nutrition ties into performance, right? So let's talk a little bit about kind of speed development and power, right? So you've worked with a, a variety of sports. Um, so yeah. will you kind of expand a little bit on how you develop speed and agility with those kind of teams? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a good question. I think um, that's probably the most important thing to me mm-hmm. uh, in the hierarchy of training is yeah. um, the weight room is last to me. Yeah. Um, I think it's if you have a good sound speed program, mm-hmm. um, it's going to make your athletes stronger yeah. um, oh, indirectly. Uh-huh. Um, but I think my, my attentions have really shifted um, because my, initially coming into the field, a lot of my, um, I guess my philosophies or my principles were uh-huh. very based on Charlie Francis yeah. and, and a lot of the speed development protocols and especially over the years, um, with Tony Holler and Chris Corfus mm-hmm. um, in Illinois yeah. and kind of, uh, Tony's like feed the cats, like the minimal effective dose mm-hmm. of, of speed training and being able to dose, it might be three sprints for a day and you do a drop off. And once you hit that drop off, then you're completely done and you may move on to something else. But um, the cognitive side for me is probably the biggest thing because mixing in the technical and the tactical, it's very hard for us as coaches to kind of dive into that realm. And you see all these different constraints-led approach and dynamic system theory Uh of of agility. And, you know, we talk about all the time, like we can have somebody that's fast or somebody even that's strong in the weight room, but it doesn't translate to the field or the court. Mm, And I think adding and building to that cognitive component, whatever your progression is and whatever you you want to put in, if it's pointing, coloring, auditory, like you Mm -hmm. put them into a skill situation, it's 
your progression has to get to that because we can do any variation of hill sprint into a weighted sled sprint into a flat sprint. Um, you can supplement it with a plyometric or jumping progression. But if it's not going to transfer to the quarter of the field Mm -hmm. and that decision making process and and the energy that's expended through the cognitive aspect of training, um, I think you're really missing the boat. And I think um, the output side Mm -hmm. I was really, really focused on because I'm like, I'm looking for numbers because a lot of times that's what that's what coaches want to see. But I've I've kind of really, really tried to emphasize I want coaches not only see numbers, but I want a coach to come up to me and say, man, X player looks so great on the court, they're moving really well. Because yeah. if I hear that, then I know a lot of the weight room numbers that strength coaches have promoted over the years mm-hmm. may not be as a big of a deal to that coach. Yeah, And, I, and I've been very fortunate. A lot of the coaches I've been around, they've not been numbers driven. They've mm-hmm. not been like, you need to do this and this. I need this guy to be faster. Well, getting them to understand too, you want them faster on the court. You want that result. Yeah. Now, how are we going to get there? And I yeah. think there's simple ways. Mm-hmm. I think, just like I said, the progressions and uh, my influences come from Charlie Francis. Like mm-hmm. I said, Tony Holler. Yeah. Um, a lot of the Franz Bosch stuff that's coming out, which mm. people either disagree or yeah. agree with. Yeah. Um, but again, it's I'm based on results. Yeah. I don't care about the gimmicks and all those things. If yeah. you can go to my toolbox and help our athletes get faster, uh-huh. if it can get them to change direction better, but also that decision-making component. How can I integrate that into our training Yeah. Um, in the progression? And how much can I do that? Because I think a big thing with speed even mm-hmm. is I have basketball, mm-hmm. and they're on the court literally all the time. So yeah. how much speed training do I need to do? I know yeah. Ryan Horn was on, on your podcast. Mm-hmm. And Ryan works at basketball, and he knows. It's like, you know, we got to do everything else a lot of the times that they're not doing on the court. Yeah. Where if we do the right things off the court and they're recovered, their uh-huh. speed are numbers are probably going to go up so i think a lot of times too it's not necessarily what you're doing speed training wise it's mm-hmm. maybe what you're not doing mm. so we can get those results yeah. and not be caught up in well you know the progressions or the exercises that you yeah. want to do to yeah. get to your intended goal yeah no i like that and then one one kind of um branch off of this right is is we know speed skiing and that's and that's one of the most important things but how does that balance with like like fitness testing for example right a lot of coaches their fitness tests are lactic and so you know, we have to train for the athlete to pass a fitness test when really we might want to be training for performance like speed kind of stuff. So how does that balance? And and that's probably one of the million dollar questions there is, Mm. uh, is having a number fitness testing wise, if they hit that number, are they going to be prepared for their sport? Yeah. yeah, yeah. When in fact, speed is the number one thing. Because if you, if you have beliefs in speed training, then you're going to probably have beliefs in a speed reserve. So the faster you are, Mm -hmm. You know, the less maximum you have to run. So mm-hmm. if I'm faster than a game, then I don't have to run as hard the whole game if you have to run at 100%. Yeah. And then, in fact, kind of turns into you are in more or better shape or don't have to be in, I guess, as good of a shape. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've not done, and like I said, I've been very fortunate, I've not done mm-hmm. a lot of fitness testing with my teams. Okay. I think, um, I think that's probably in due to some technology-based things, but staying away from the lactic-based testing. Yeah. Um, especially for sports that don't need it. Yeah. And I was in football. Uh-huh. Um, so I completely understand of the traditional, yeah. of this is what we've always done type mm-hmm. of thing. Um, but it's also the overall intended result in, in, in educating coaches because it is a slippery slope. Yeah. Depending on the coach that you have uh-huh. and how you communicate those things, just like we talked about continuing yeah. education, is like how do I get across to them that this is the right way when in fact this is the one thing that they want and you don't mm-hmm. come off guns blazing yeah and become offensive of well this is my realm and uh-huh. let me do my job yeah more of we're in this together and how do we get to that point so i think the balance of that is you know speed testing to me is number one uh-huh. then the, i think the the breadth of especially the aerobic mm-hmm. um side of things how much do they need yeah and i've always done a lot of tempo running and a lot of different things like that mm-hmm. to um expand because it's very simple and i can do it with a lot of my teams but the volume and the number will dictate from soccer to football to basketball mm. and in the setting that we're in so yeah, yeah. um like i said I've not done a ton of fitness testing, uh-huh. but I think it's also getting the coaches involved too. Of when they see their athletes, and a lot of my sports are always doing skill work throughout the year. Yeah, is what do they look like? Because yeah. I mean, complete op- our men's basketball team did really no running at all this whole year. Mm-hmm. Um, our coach believes in doing it in practice. Yeah, and a lot um, where our women's side maybe wants more 
or conditioning. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of figure out even the style of play. But I think that's where you're matching up all those factors, the technical, yeah. the tactical, the psychological, the uh-huh. physical. And it's not just my little component of strength and conditioning. It's expanding it across and, and getting that to the coaches where you don't get peg hold with some of that stuff too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also remembering, hey, if they can't ever get to the ball fast enough, it doesn't matter how long we can run in the game because then we're not going to win. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So uh, emphasizing that because that's what they want too. And yeah. Most coaches want the result. They just honestly don't know how to get there. Yeah. And speaking it in their language mm-hmm. so you're on the same page too. Mm, I like that. Okay. And then kind of transitioning a little bit, right? So what is kind of your philosophy for how you manage your staff? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've kind of, I want to say, change that over time but Uh I think I've evolved in kind of my leadership style I'm a very overall uh, I'm not a micromanager Um, I truly believe if you hire good people you're around good people you Uh put them in a position to do the job that you have I think one of my strengths has been I'm not a micromanager but Mm -hmm. I think one of my weaknesses has been that I'm not a micromanager and I kind of try to put the fence up of, Hey, this is what our standards are, what our values are. Uh Um, and this is where I want you to go, but I want you to be who you are and I want you to add that different personality, that different skill set, um, to our department. And, and we don't have a lot of coaches that are working side by side with teams. They have their own team. So, you know, even when I came to FAU is, personalities wise the staff members that were here mm-hmm. um are very different even the person i hired there yeah. he is different than myself yeah, um, yeah. And i think either leadership wise but also just uh, i think personality on the floor and things mm-hmm. like that so um i've broken it up and, and kind of evolved but you know leadership wise of developing the culture kind of influencing the behaviors uh-huh. and even the professional side is outlining those things for my staff mm-hmm. and i outline it through physical psychological technical tactical okay just like we do in sport yeah but i talk more about you know building trust achieving results Mm -hmm. um the professional side of how i expect you to be Mm -hmm. but i've had long lists i've had all these things and i think the biggest thing for me even going forward as a coach and as a leader Mm -hmm. um is simplifying a bunch of those things and, yeah. and trying to condense it down to one word yeah. or a pair, like a sentence. Mm-hmm. So you don't have all these things of you can't do this, 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 and this. No, this is what we're about. And yeah. if it doesn't align with that, then you probably need to question if this is going to be the right thing to do. Mm. Um, and I think that ties into our athletes too. Yeah. The, the, if you were to see my, my handbook that I have mm-hmm. and it, it has our staff standards and our athlete standards yeah. and they're almost identical. Yeah. But it's just a couple tweaks of coming from the coach and the student athlete perspective because my same expectation for you yeah. should be the same expectation for the athlete. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, try not to flood people with too much information, but yeah. make it simple enough of this is what you should be doing, uh-huh. and if it doesn't align, then again, you should be probably questioning that. Yeah. Um, and give people freedom so they can make mistakes, uh-huh. but they also can grow as leaders. Because I hope and. And I've been very fortunate that people under me of getting bigger jobs from mm-hmm. GA to assistant to assistant to the head. Yeah. Um, but giving them the opportunity to also to grow and figure out what their leadership style is, what their purpose is, what mm-hmm. their why, like all those things. Yeah. So when they get in a position to be a leader, um, I think a lot of people talk about it. And a lot of people read a lot of books about it. Yeah. The application of it, mm. um, I think, is something that is very difficult sometimes. I agree. Because... Yeah it matches to the setting that you're in. There's yeah. a lot of things I'm doing here mm-hmm. that I could not have done at, at Gardner Webb mm-hmm. or we couldn't have done at EKU. Yeah. And depending on where you're at is it, setting yourself up and your staff mm-hmm. um, to be those leaders that they need to be, not necessarily what I want them to be. Mm, okay. And then pulling a little bit all, or pulling a little bit more on that thread, right? What does that kind of internship program and staff development kind of look like? Yeah, I think one thing for us here is that, you know, with football and sharing a weight room right now, and they're uh-huh. moving into a new facility very soon is uh, being very smart with our internship program and not to have one, just to have one mm-hmm. um, is, is really having a structured plan of um, I've always told a lot of people, there's a lot of things interns don't get taught. They mm-hmm. get taught about X's and O's and periodization and yeah. reading all these different things, but the outside aspect mm-hmm. of managing, you know, your career, financial stuff, yeah. Um, talk about marriage you talk mm-hmm. about all those things yeah. having that stuff set up um but also um 
what can we do to set other people up for success? Yeah. And I think along the lines of that is, is just giving people a good structure. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, it's having a structure or a system, mm-hmm. but having it bare bones enough that you can fill in to give those that are under you or the intern or the staff um, what they need specifically. So mm-hmm. figuring out what's most important to them. Yeah. And then how can I help you to do that? Okay. Um, and I think even with our staff is um, that's one question I ask all the time in our, our you know, evaluations over time is what's the most important thing to you and, and what can I do for you? Mm. Cause that kind of ties back to my, my, my why or my yeah. purpose is serving people. Yeah. Well, I got to understand what you need and I need to make that important to me. And I think that's what caring means is mm. what's important to you. How can I help you? And I want you to see that that's also important to me. So if that's time off, if that's all these different things that might be the one thing that's going to help you do a better job yeah. for us and my staff, but the athletes, mm-hmm. Where can we find that? And I also want to see the interns to see that too, because yeah. I also want them to see not necessarily us doing things right, but uh-huh. also being aware of how people are going to manage them and yeah. what they need to look for as they go through their career. Yeah. Um, because you're going to be working for somebody all the time. So you obviously want to work for somebody that be- possibly believes some of the same things <laughs> as you, yeah. but also, you know, what am I really navigating in this and yeah. not just getting you know, trial by fire once I get out and try to get a job and then it's not as, as realistic as I thought. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. Okay. And then kind of moving into this last segment here, right? Um, just kind of some things that influenced you and you, you touched a little bit on the psychology of when you were coming up, right, of, of majoring in that. So what are some resources that have had a big impact on you, whether that's a book, podcast, and it doesn't necessarily have to be strength and conditioning related? Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's been a a lot of influence. I think my mm-hmm. psychology background might be the best thing I've had. Okay. Um, honestly, because like I, I was doing interviews with parents and children and, and different psychological assessments mm-hmm. and you see all these dynamics of having to communicate with people. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a people business. Most definitely. And um, I see a lot of things, even in my psychology realm, that's coming back through mm, a lot okay. of the central ner- nervous system stuff, a yeah. lot of the recovery stuff. It all ties into um, some of the psychology things I was doing mm-hmm. um, from the neuropsychology perspective. So if you research some of that stuff, you're yeah. seeing a lot of it just because people are trying to find that next inch yeah. to help performance. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to see coming full circle. But, um, you know, I, I think with it goes along with the continuing education, all those things. Uh, a lot of people that really had an influence on me and resource-wise, I think, is um, – you know, the Central Virginia Sports Performance Clinic mm. um, with Jay DeMeo. Yeah. Um, Jay does a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and seeing people like him and then a lot of people that have off shoot from him and people he's learned from, Joseph Johnson, mm-hmm. um, Jeff Moyer, yeah. um, Dr. Michael Yeses. There's a lot of people that people have heard mm-hmm. that are different than the mainstream. Mm-hmm. And that's something I think I try to search not just to be different, yeah. but to hear another side of things. Yeah, perspective. Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of the... The Eastern Bloc methodologies, a lot of these things that have been around for a long time, but yeah. I think that people kind of misinterpret mm-hmm. um, is something that I've learned a lot from. Yeah, and, and just figuring out people that have success, mm-hmm. and not just because they may have a bunch of budget or a bunch of talent. Yeah, why are they having success? And I want to learn from you. Yeah, and figuring at any level it is, mm-hmm. um, but also. I've learned a lot through that is the humility side of trying to share as much as you can. I hope if anybody were to reach out to me that anything I have, I will give to you all our program. Like, I don't care. I'll give it to you because mm-hmm. it, you can, and I want to help people going forward as much as I can. Cause I've been in that position, but um, you know, being able to show others that they don't have to be afraid to reach out and yeah. kind of ask questions and things like that. Because mm-hmm. I think our, I think strength and conditioning is really great about that. Yeah. Um, there's not too many people I've reached out to where they're just like, no, I'm, I'm not going to help you. Yeah. Um, but kind of putting them the best foot forward for our field and the people around me. So there's a lot of things that have influenced me, mm-hmm. I, I, but I think more now even than ever, a lot of my direction has been geared towards leadership and management because mm-hmm. there's strength and conditioning. You figure out maybe this is what I believe and then you can really weed out yeah. stuff that aligns with you and doesn't. But I'm going to be managing people if I stay in this or administration or whatever it is for the rest of my life. So mm. that is what I have to be really good because I yeah. think it's the communication of what I'm trying to get across to the people I deal with every day mm-hmm. instead of just getting more and more information and then not doing anything with it and yeah. then not being able to apply it. But uh, yeah, 
application of that stuff. I like that. That's and that's really important. I think it's overlooked yep. as well. Um, and then kind of moving into this this last little block here, right? Just some rapid fire questions. Yep. Um, so what if you have some? What are some quotes that you live by? That's a good one. <laughs> um, I think uh, I think one of the biggest quotes lately. Um, and uh, again, it kind of ties into my why. Mm-hmm. Um, I think of serve and sacrifice for others, okay. and really be able to do that and live that every single day. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the biggest quotes is that I've kind of lived by lately is "You don't know what you don't know." Mm. I think the awareness of certain things, yeah, um, and being able to pick up on those things around me, uh-huh. if that's at home, if that's at my job, um, and truly taking a, a perspective of both sides of an argument and yeah. being humble enough to to realize what you're good at and what you're bad at, yeah. I think is one of the biggest quotes because uh, I've seen so many things even in the past six months of uh-huh. like, you see it at surface level yeah. and you don't see how deep it is and you don't go down it because you might have a bias. Yeah. And um, truly being, if I want to serve and sacrifice for others, then I need to be uh, humble enough to, to look at all angles of the issue, situation, whatnot. So mm, I, like that. Um, I think that... and. It's funny because one of the other quotes is um, I've said it one or two times for athletes mm-hmm. and um, I tell them, I say it's not for everybody <laughs> and talk about everything in general. So lot, our men's basketball team has taken on that hardcore. So yeah. they say it all. If something goes on or a situation goes on, it's like a mindset almost for them now. I like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And then is there a thought or experience from your past that you've held on to that has made a big difference in your life now? <sighs> yeah, I, th- I think it's. Well, probably one of the biggest ones is making the transition into coaching. I mm. think it's um, that jump and that that leap of faith that we kind of we kind of did, and it, it ties into you know our spiritual beliefs and, yeah. and things like that. But I think that that decision, um, I don't think I'd realize. I mean, I, t- I literally talked to somebody yesterday that yeah. called me about management of people and yeah. i'm not the one to think that i'm even good at it and but they were talking about things of leadership and then yeah. kind of went into their situation and was just like hey like you know i know you transitioned a lot when do you think it's the right time to do this and yeah. then got into more of the personal side of like this is their situation what do i think about it yeah and never going in or making these certain jumps i think those experiences you know have affected me at certain points, but then looking back, it's almost going to help somebody else. And I've seen that along the way. So that's been the really cool thing to see is that, um, some of those jumps or some of those hard times, obviously I think sometimes happen so you can help somebody else yeah. down the road and you just don't have the perspective at that time. So. Mm, that's important. Okay. What's the best advice you've ever been given? I think, um, best advice I've ever been given is probably from, um, probably from my parents. I mean, okay. They, they told me, and I've, I've kind of self, I'm very self-driven person, yeah. um, but I think they really, really shaped me into the fact of, um, they always used to tell me of, you know, they, they worked manual labor jobs and they worked and a lot of people in my family, um, growing up in Indiana, it was just, if you're called to be a ditch digger, you're called to be the president of the United States, mm. you do your job to a hundred percent. And I think that's something I've always taken is, Um, especially in a job where you're working a lot, Mm -hmm. um, but doing everything to the best of your ability as best as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not just for the, the showiness part or Mm -hmm. to try to make a name for yourself, but that's what everyone else deserves. If you are serving and and it's a service industry Mm -hmm. that you're doing that every single day, because, um, that's what you should be doing. Um, and I think that's that advice right there. Mm -hmm. Um, I've taken, uh, probably every single place, but I think I see it more and more um, just kind of through society and culture and things like that. Of mm. um, Everyone else deserves that. They need the best foot forward for me yeah. in regards to what I'm doing, where I'm at next year, mm-hmm. um, where I'm at, where my feet are at. I should be doing it to the best of my ability and not try to look too far ahead. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. And then in contrast to that, right, what's the worst advice you've ever been given? Man, I saw that question and I was asking my <laughs> wife, like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What to answer that? That's that's a really good question. Um, I think I think probably one of the uh, I won't even say it was advice directly to me, mm-hmm. but I think um, you know the cliche um, what you permit you promote. Yeah, I think I've heard a lot of people be like, "Well, these things don't matter," mm-hmm. and 
I realize more and more that that stuff does matter. Yeah. Um, those small things. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not to say it's like a, a dictator style. Yeah. Everything has to be ducks in a row. Yeah. But there's a lot of things that if you see it at first glance uh-huh. and you see people not doing certain things, yeah. it's going to be a a uh, snowball effect into the bigger things. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah. I, I never used to be, I never used to be this, I want to say culture person, mm-hmm. but I would say that there's a lot of things that people do take for granted or i think there's a lot of things people think are not that big of a deal yeah that indirectly are a big deal that are going to affect most likely where they want to go yeah so. yeah no i agree okay and then last question on that part is what is one of the biggest struggles you've had to overcome um i think i think it goes in line probably with the the transition okay into into coaching i yeah. think um you know, I was married and I had a child and yeah. I, uh, making this transition of, man, did we make the right decision? Mm. And, um, we've been very blessed along our way and, and being able to do a lot of things that we wanted to do. And, yeah. um, but I think in making that initial jump and I think telling other people, if, if that's what you feel like you're supposed to be doing, yeah. um, coaching's one of those weird professions that, um, a lot of people in your family probably don't understand what you're doing Mm -hmm. and why you do it and the amount of hours you work. Yeah. So I think taking that and, and having that self doubt of even something that you really feel passionate about and that you want to do for a living. Um, I think that struggle right there, um, you may not see it now, but it's probably going to kind of come through at some time, but it's going to be tough. And I think this profession is very tough. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, picking your spots and figuring those things out. I think yeah. in the long run it is good, but I think it's, it's not for the, the meager person. It's yeah. you've, you've, you've got to strap up because yeah. it is difficult sometimes. Most so. definitely. Okay. And then what are some projects that you're currently working on? How can people kind of reach out to you and follow your journey? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm on Twitter and, and Facebook. I, I, I retweet a lot of stuff. I probably don't post a lot of things. Okay. Um, sometimes I feel like I have, <laughs> I have nothing to say because <laughs> um, I steal so much of other people's stuff. Uh-huh. Um, but I think one of the projects, and I kind of alluded to it with my wife, mm. she started a, a Coach's Wife podcast, and mm. I've been in talk with a couple people, and, yeah. and obviously the podcast you're doing and uh-huh. getting tips from people is, is starting a podcast about um, – everything else outside of coaching yeah. and all those hard things like we're talking about that yeah um you know people talk about but uh-huh. they sometimes maybe talk with their staff they're afraid to talk about yeah um, family life transitioning mm-hmm. yeah like there's these things that you don't even think about as in, in, in coaching yeah that we all do but no one talks about you know getting yeah. fired getting hired um moving to a new place how to start all over again yeah um so that's something that um, I've really thought about trying to do and set it up, almost do like a blog or a website. And then okay. having that is just a resource to help people and yeah. give people a, um, resources and tools uh-huh. to help them through. So they feel like they're not alone. Cause yeah. that's probably one of the biggest things I've talked to people about. Yeah. And I don't know how it's gotten to that, yeah. but I think, um, that's what's needed in our field because mm-hmm. we don't have a lot of that stuff. And I think that will help our field look like more like a profession. Cause yeah. I think that's one thing a lot of people are like, yeah. We don't feel like our field is um, a profession; it's just a job or a vocation. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things we don't have in there, support system-wise, even that a lot of other jobs have. Yeah. And if you're gonna get fired, then you better have um, backup plans and resources and a way to get additional income and mm-hmm. all these different things, yeah. so you can prepare yourself. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something, and just continuing on of. Um, trying to promote the right things about the field and, mm. and putting out good information. Yeah. And like I said, if anyone ever wants to reach out and talk to me, I'll give you everything I got and I'd love yeah. to and help anybody that I can. Fantastic. And, and then what's the best way to get in contact with you? Yeah. Um, you can contact me on Twitter. Um, my uh, name's CM McCormick seven. Um, okay. if you just search my name or on Facebook, yeah. um, or also my email, um, which is on Florida Atlantic's website. Mm-hmm. But like I said, I, if anyone, um, needs anything, I, I would love to chat or help or anything yeah. like that. Cause I'm like uh, most of us were lifelong learners and yeah. um, trying to learn as much as I can from whoever I speak to and, yeah. and kind of help them along their journey. Fantastic. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time. This has been fantastic. Um, looking forward to putting it out and, and hopefully connecting again soon in the future. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much.